Hey there, this is Phil. Welcome back to the show. I am here with Christian Taylor. Mm-hmm. Isn't she in France? Is she in France? Is that where she is? I think she's in France. Christian Taylor's in France, we think. So she's not here, but Sky Jatani's here. I'm here. But he's going to have to leave when the guest comes. I will. Because he's allergic to this guest. Actually, I'm really disappointed I won't be here with the guest. He likes this guest. He's not allergic to this guest. Mm-hmm. I was just kidding about that part, but he has to leave because he has to go to Portland. I have to catch a flight. He's been re- drafted by the Trailblazers. He's a Trailblazer. Yeah, that's, they're laughing over there because you think that's so funny. <laughs> it is pretty funny. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. We got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend it here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Hi, Phil. Hi. But not Christian, too, because she's in France saying, wee, oui, wee, oui, woo, woo. That's what they say in France. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend it here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The wow. Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Wee, wee, woo, woo. Yeah, that's what they say. It's when they're dancing the can-can and they throw up their skirts. Wee, wee, woo, woo. (laughs) I have been burned by you before. That's from Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Uh, Were you hit by any hurricanes? No. Over the last week? No. Because you were traveling. I was. I was in Costa Rica. And I I got a couple of texts from some of my family children asking if I was going to be okay because of Irma and, mm-hmm. and I texted my children back a map mm-hmm. in which I, I highlighted the hurricane mm-hmm. and then I showed where Costa Rica was okay. and I condemned them for their failure <laughs> of their geographical, geographical fa- I was really condemning you, the American laud, educational system did you laud their concern no. before you condemned their failure no oh, okay I was I was like one of the geography really? B champions. Geography was your thing. It was my thing. And do you think that's just because it's just pure retention? Are you just good at retention, or can you picture space really well? I'm in pretty your good mind? at picturing space. I also traveled a lot as a kid, so I was in the yeah. maps. But are you good at memorizing like state capitals? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which part were you really good at? I was good at knowing what's where and oh, what the okay. countries and, you know. Okay. That kind of thing. What's the capital of Botswana? I don't know. <laughs> I, geography is more than capitals. I don't know either. <clears throat> what's the uh, top export of Botswana? <laughs> Probably you don't memorize coffee. You, you or got something? to memorize the little box scores from the encyclopedia. Oh, Every I country has a little box score, and you got to mem- yeah, got to commit those all to memory. Okay, you sound a little congested. I am congested. I was I got sick over the weekend. Sounds like you're retaining something. <laughs> retaining, yeah, I am. It's true, but I'm okay. I'm recovering. Uh, yesterday I felt lousy. The day before I felt lousy. And you got sick in, in you were sick in Costa Rica. Oh, yeah, I got the day I flew down there. I was pretty miserable. And the, yeah. but within a day or two, I was on the mend. There's nothing worse though than long flights. Yeah. With bad head cold and yeah. And the Seriously. poor person next to me and I was sneezing like crazy. Seriously, it was oh, not good. It's bad. So people are probably asking right now. Mm. They're talking out loud to the show, but we can't hear them because it doesn't work that way. Mm. Why were you in Costa Rica, Sky? I was in Costa Rica to uh, speak uh, multiple days for a large gathering of YWAM leaders, Youth with a Mission, and the University of the Nations. Oh. It was great. Five languages were represented by 800 people, and it was uh, the translators, especially Carlos. I don't know if you listen to this, Carlos, but he did a great job because I. It's one of those deals where I had to say a sentence or a thought, and then I'd have to stop, and they'd have to translate it into five different languages. Well, he would do it in Spanish because English and Spanish were the two most common languages okay. in the room. But then they had a headphone translators, oh, yeah, in, hooked in, up to Google Translates. I don't know how they did it, but yeah, it was it was a really diverse room, and it, we the whole thing was built around. Um, actually, it was really interesting. They took my. Uh, ideas from the book Futureville. Yeah. And then they combined it with videos from the Bible Project. Oh, wow. So they got permission from the Bible Project. It was a mashup. It was a mashup, and it worked really, really well. Wow. Yeah. A Sky Bible Project mashup. Yes, and it worked really well. So Where else have those two things been mashed up? On our podcast. On our podcast. Mm -hmm. Thank Mm -hmm. you very much. Okay. 
Uh, we probably we didn't have time to talk about this when it happened because you were gone mm-hmm. and you'd written a really nice statement about it, but you couldn't state it, and I didn't want to try to defend it because it's probably indefensible. But anyway, uh, the two weeks ago, the Nashville statement. Yes. Nashville made a statement. The city of Nashville. <laughs> they actually did. The city of Nashville came out yeah, and the distanced city of, themselves the from the statement. The mayor of Nashville made a statement distancing her, herself, I think. I don't remember. From the Nashville statement. For those that were just watching the weather the mm-hmm. last three weeks, uh, what's the Nashville statement? So there's a group called the, the, the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Is that what they're called? Mm-hmm. And they put out this Nashville statement, which was 14 points about basically saying we don't agree with gay marriage and homosexuality and transgender anything. We still don't. We still Not, don't. It wasn't taking a new right. position. And they were asking Christian leaders, evangelical leaders to sign on with this statement. Yeah. And so it caused a bit of a uh, hubbub. Ker- kerfuffle. Kerfuffle. Um, for various reasons, so yeah, and it was the what's the name of that group? The it's, the committee. It's the council council for, for biblical, biblical manhood and womanhood. The C B M W. The C B M W. Yeah. Okay. It's like to get C B M W. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Now I'll never forget it. There you go. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Could you do cute little mnemonic devices like that for all my favorite uh, abbreviations? Um, and also the ERLC jumped in, which I assume is why it was released out of Nashville that week, because it was together with the ERLC National Conference yes, I think that so. I spoke at, not knowing that behind the curtains there the, was this... The, there was a statement this brewing. This Congressional Congress meeting yeah. and about to issue the Declaration of of uh, whatever this is. My, my iPad just crashed Oh no, what happened? Me. Oh no. Okay, so why don't people like it, Sky? Well, some people like it just fine because there's obviously people who've signed it. I actually came yeah. across it as I, I was, uh, I saw on Twitter one day and I saw that John Piper was tweeting about it because he's one of the big yeah. signers. and He's a signatory. He, he's, a, he's a big fan. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on the surface of it, I can understand why people would sign it or, or affirm it because on the surface, again, it seems to simply restate what has been traditional Orthodox Christian teaching about sexuality and marriage. Yeah. So in that sense, it shouldn't surprise anyone for conservative Christians to reassert conservative Christian teaching. Correct. But so why were people surprised? I think there's a couple different factors here. One was, uh, Nobody was kind of wondering what Southern Baptists or the Biblical Council for Manhood and Womanhood think about mm-hmm. any of this. So it's like, why Why is this necessary? So it wasn't really in question. Yeah, that's number one. Number two, the tone of it caught a lot of people off guard. Yeah. Because uh, it struck a lot of people as pastorally insensitive. Mm. It... it um, it, it every it has I think fourteen parts and each one says we affirm such and such and we deny such and such, mm-hmm. and it's a very uh, stark statement offering no uh, self reflection or area where the church has failed in these areas. There was no self right um, indictment like. Yeah, we know the church hasn't done a great job on marriage, or the church hasn't done great with the issue of divorce, or the church hasn't done great in loving or caring for LGBT people, whatever. You know, there's none of that in it. It's just, this is what we think, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. And then another big uh, sticking point was Article 10. Yeah, which Article if my 10. Ooh, the, inf- iPad the was, infamous Article the 10. The infamous Article 10. If my iPad was working, I could read it for you, but it was crashed. Article 10 basically said... It's back. It's back. I know, Your but it's not back. working. It keeps crashing on me. What? Let me get rid of What's that one. What's going on? Okay. Tim Cook doesn't like this story. I don't know. Um, in a nutshell, Article 10 says that this is not something that Christians can agree to disagree on. Like you are either with us, with us or, or you're you're out or you are a bad Christian. Yeah. And what kind of got even further, and this is what I wrote my piece about, was, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with all of the tone of the document and I, I but I don't disagree with some of the basic theology of it, but I know a little bit about the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood and I, and, and Denny Burke, the leader of that organization. And what he said about the statement was pretty 
striking. Um, He said this, this is a quote, anyone who persistently rejects God's revelation about sexual holiness and virtue is rejecting Christianity altogether, Mm -hmm. even if they claim otherwise. So Mm -hmm. what he's essentially saying is if you disagree with us Mm -hmm. on this issue, you're not just disagreeing with us on this issue. You are rejecting all of Christian faith. Right. And and is that you or me? Who's singing? Somebody's. (laughs) I think it's you. (laughs) What have you got going on there? Oh, it is me. Look at that. (laughs) What are you? I was. I was pulling. (laughs) That was funny. I was pulling up uh, the Nashville statement, and an ad came up and started playing audio. That's hilarious, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, Denny Burke goes on to say that this statement is meant to be a, a line in the sand that you are either with us or against us. And I found the whole enterprise unnecessary and unnecessarily divisive. And at a time when a lot of Christian communities, colleges, families, churches are struggling with these issues and where more dialogue and conversation is necessary, this statement just comes in and says, nope, this is it. This is the only way to think. And if you disagree, you're out. And so on that level, I it, just find it, it really that unhelpful. isn't a reaction? Because in the last few years, uh, you know, people like Tony Campolo and more recently Jen Hatmaker mm-hmm. have come out as being marriage equality affirming, LGBT affirming. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure what you would say they've mm-hmm. come out as being, but they've, to, to many people, have crossed a line. Mm-hmm. You've crossed a line. And it seems to me that this is really a statement geared more at that crowd. I think you're probably right. You are now on the other side of the fence from us. And and I think if you came out and said, hey, look, we continue to affirm this view of sexuality and marriage, and we know there are Christians who disagree with us, that's one thing. It's another thing to say those people who disagree with us are not only rejecting this, but they're rejecting Christianity entirely. Yeah. That's kind of, yeah. That's harsh. That's harsh. But then, third, the document does nothing to strengthen their case. It's not yeah. a document that says, hey, we are going to continue to affirm traditional views of sexuality and marriage, and here's why. Like, here's our case for why that's, it, it's not opening yeah. dialogue, you're not changing anyone's mind, you're not making anybody who's tempted to think differently re-engage scripture or rethink the theology. It's just this, here's what we think, you're wrong, you're with us or against us. I'm like, is this really adding to the yeah. positive direction? <clears throat> Even if you d- agree with the theology that's stated here, there's no explanation behind it, there's no, um, there's no looking at the log in our own eye, it's yeah. only the speck in the others. When I was and, living in the city, uh, I think it was just before I got married. I had a good friend who is a, a strong believer, um, Catholic, grew up Catholic, raised Catholic, still staunchly Catholic at that point. And at one point we were talking about theology or, or behavior among conservative Christians. And he just turned to me and said, why are you guys so hung up about sex? Mm-hmm. And I, and I, you know, my first response was, well, what do you mean? I mean, that's like, it's like the most important thing. <laughs> You know, what do you mean? Because there was, because this was right in the middle of, you know, true love waits and the love dare and, yeah. you know, not the love dare, that's different. Um, but this big movement that we have right. to get our kids to not have sex above all else. Right. It was the only, it was like the only thing we were talking about. And, and, and uh, Josh McDowell was touring to try to get kids to stop having sex. When I think about Josh McDowell, it makes me not want to have sex. Okay, that's just fantastic. <laughs> Just lost that part of our audience. I'm just saying. <laughs> the I think Josh McDowell is kind of cute wing of our audience mm-hmm. just walked out the door. And, and I thought, well, that's kind of a... I, when I finally took a step back and thought about all of the things that Jesus was really... would get a little mm-hmm. worked up about, why have we picked that one and made it so huge? Yeah. I mean, there's two extremes. One extreme is to make sex and everything about the Christian life. And the other extreme is to say it is it doesn't matter at all or shouldn't factor into our discipleship or, yeah, or purity right. in any way. That's an extreme also. Okay. But yeah, evangelicalism as, as a whole is probably faulted on the side of overemphasizing this mm-hmm. single aspect of our lives. But it is, a, it is a legitimately significant cultural thing right now, yeah. right, with the legalization yeah. of gay marriage. And a lot of churches are struggling with... How do we think about this and how do we move forward as, as a church in a mission field where marriage is now accepted between two men or two women? So I get it. It's, it's a legitimate issue. The question is, what's the right way to address it? Right. And 
I mean, we have friends who have signed this document. I understand because I think some of the theology resonates with them. But as a as a cultural uh, artifact of something you're putting into the culture for a conversation, I'm worried this does more harm than good. It does not open up dialogue. It does not even make a case for why a traditional view is right or better mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. more uh, you know, flourishing for people. It, it's just this kind of snarky, we're right, you're wrong, you're with us, you're against us, end of story. And I don't yeah. think that helps much. Yeah. What would, what do you think would help? Well, and the, <laughs> what a, would you have done, Sky, if you were the well, director I, of the Biblical Council for Women and Men acting like Old Testament women and men? <laughs> what would you well, have that done? Well, that raises another issue is this organization, which again, I have some background knowledge of. You know, it was created in the 1980s explicitly to push a complementarian view of manhood and womanhood right. and to fight against... Define for the audience. So the view that men and women, while equal and both created in the image of God, have been given distinctly different roles to play in the household, right. in society, and in church. Right. And so <clears throat> this organization was created to combat what they saw as the advancement of feminism. Mm. So... Even in the statement itself, there is some implicit mm-hmm. theology from mm-hmm. Genesis that reinforces a complementarian view. So they they kind of snuck that in mm-hmm. to the document as well. Not that you you know have to be a complementarian to sign it, but it's there. So this organization overall, I think, has been a lot of my discomfort with them has been that they intentionally try to be provocative just to get attention. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what this kind statement is kind of like us. I don't think we're well, yeah, no. intentionally provocative. I play the ukulele. You find that provocative. I find it. You make something. You just made a joke about Josh McDowell. I did. And his looks. Yeah, but that's, oh my that's not gonna that's not gonna get you in the New York Times. Oh, okay. So we're just not very good at that's it. That's right. We're just we're just lousy <laughs> at it. <laughs> Much better at right. it. Right. So and again, I don't think anyone was sitting around going, gee, I really wonder what the Southern Baptists or the Council think for about, Men think about gay marriage. Yeah. It's, it's like you're not clarifying anything there, that people didn't know. There's also a clear statement in it and, and this surprised me a little bit that that's really directly addressing um, transgenderism. Right. That God made you something and you need to stay that thing. Right. It doesn't, it's, those aren't the exact words. <laughs> that's not an exact <laughs> You should quote. have been on the committee, Phil. It's very, it's a little more, it's more flowery than that. But, the, but what it means yeah. is God made you something. Uh-huh. It is a sin to not be the thing God made you. Right. And that kind of surprised me just because we, and we've talked about this on the podcast, that, that gender isn't quite as binary right. as we grew up thinking. Well, there's a difference between gender and sex. Yeah. Sex is a biological, yeah. m- usually male or female. Right. Whereas gender is more of a spectrum of masculinity and femininity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I, I guess I'm wondering when we decided that that was an mm-hmm. issue that Christians needed to fight about that if you're a, yeah. if you if you have biological man shapes you must always dress and present as a man mm-hmm. or you're sinning right is it it's at, that argument's been around for a little while yeah but I, are we really that are we really that dug in about that and is that biblical uh, is there a verse that there probably is in the old testament don't dress like a woman yeah, yeah, but and my question is, where where then does body modification? Where do you draw the line on body modification? Yeah, I remember years ago I was doing a radio interview with a Christian radio station in another city, and I was that will remain it will nameless. remain nameless. But I was on the phone, right? Kind of, I called in to do this interview on this radio station, and they go to commercial, and I can hear the commercial on the phone. And the funny thing is, I was there to talk about my book, um, The Divine Commodity, which is all about consumerism in the church. Yeah. And the commercial that comes on was for a Christian cosmetic surgeon encouraging women who listen to this Christian radio station mm-hmm. to get breast augmentation surgery. <laughs> and, 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 you know, rhinoplasty, a nose job. And, yeah. and I'm like, really? This yeah. is, so, okay, if it's wrong for me to, to change my gender or have, you know, my body parts change to, uh, yeah. you know, that, is it wrong for a Christian to get breast implants or to get a nose job yeah. or to use contact lenses or to have a tattoo or to as not, long as they liposuction. Stayed, as they 
stay the same sex. It's it, everything. Everything is, else is okay. Everything else is okay. But it, you know, if God made me flat chested, is yeah. it wrong for me to yeah. no longer you know whatever whatever right. the my, or you know liposuction? Pick your your right. cosmetic procedure and. So I don't know. That's part of it. And then again, the statement to go back to what it doesn't say, you, know, you can make a case that same sex marriage is not what scripture teaches, but the statement says nothing about how the church is accommodated to divorce or to, yeah, you know, all right. these other things that right. we've done to adjust our view of marriage over the last hundred years. Right. right. So it, it seems awfully focused. And another person brought up the point that the, the statement comes out against Christians who identify as gay. Like, even though they are not same-sex married, even though they are sexually abstinent, yeah. there are some Christians who still identify as gay. Okay. And this statement says you can't do that You're either. You're not supposed to? You're not supposed to do that. Well, who made that rule? What verse is that? <laughs> so, Doesn't yeah. at some point this have to go back to the Bible somewhere? Well, I mean, Preferably they, they, not Leviticus? They, they try to do that in the statement. Again, there's okay. things about the statement that I would affirm, but yeah. as a whole, I think it does more harm than good. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, some, you know, obviously, there, we don't disagree with the whole statement. It's more about tone and timing and why are we... Emphasis. Yeah, why are we talking about this right now? Because at the same time, did you know that Christian America is dwindling? Did you know that? This is really a newsflash? Yeah. It's a headline? <laughs> it is. Almost every Christian denomination in the U.S. shows signs of growing diversity as white Christians, once the majority in most mainline Protestant and Catholic denominations, give way to younger members who tend to be of different races. For the first time in American history, white Christians are a minority. First time in American history. Well, you know. Hey, hey, don't. I'm sure when the pilgrims first came over, they were a minority. <laughs> okay. The Indians all looked around that's going... a valid... I think we outnumber them. That's a valid point. Okay, here's, here's uh, what this study just discovered. Among the survey's chief findings, in 1976, white Christians were 81% of the population. 1976. You know what happened in 1976? Jimmy Carter. I was born. Oh, and that changed. And then it and all went, went down. Went, yeah. That's it. Uh, now it's 43%. 43%. Wow, it's half. Oh, wait. 43, oh, yeah, it's less than half the public. 43% of Americans identify as white Christians. It's cut in half. 30% as white Protestants. So it has literally been cut in half in 40 years. But that... that I'm doing my math right. That yeah. needs to be... Uh, that has to be a factor of immigration, and birth rates, not just people leaving yeah. the church. Yeah, it does. Because most of the people coming into the country are non-white. Right, but also are Christian. The majority yes, of Yes, but this is about Christian. white Christians. Yes, and that's why I, I, that kind of bothers me when people say white Christians are declining, therefore Christianity is on its way out. Right, when in fact no, it's, it's just it's white the, Christianity. You're talking about the diversity of the church, right. not, the, not the death of the church. Um, what denomination is the most white? Do, do, hmm. do, do, oh, well, if you, do, the, you're talking do, about Christian denomination? Do, yeah. Do, so do, Mormons, do, you're not counting Mormons. Do, do, no. Do, 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 uh, Episcopalian. Do, 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 do. Lutherans. Lutheran, oh, yeah. Okay. Lutherans are 92% white, and that's each individual Lutheran <laughs> is 92% white. And um, what's the other 8%? I, I'm not allowed to say by law. White Christians are aging. Ludafisk. Eight <laughs> percent of Lutherans. Is, well, if they're Minnesota Lutherans, it's Ludafisk. If they're uh, a, uh, Wisconsin Lutherans, it's beer. The other eight, nine uh, percent is beer. Mm -hmm. um, white Christians are aging. One in ten white Catholics, evangelicals, and mainline Protestants are under thirty, compared with three in ten of Hindus and Buddhists are under thirty. So Buddhists and Hindus are having more babies. Uh, apparently. Muslims and Mormons are the youngest faith groups in the U.S. with 42% of all Muslims under 30 and nearly a quarter of all Mormons. And one in 10 white Christians. Well, what about non-white Christians? It doesn't even say. They look like they, it doesn't count. That annoys me about mm -hmm. these studies. It was like with evangelicals voting. Well, maybe, maybe they did count, but it wasn't reported in this article. 
Yeah, maybe they did count it, yeah. but it's, that's not. So anyway, uh, the Catholic Church, more, more uh, survey results. The Catholic Church is headed south, not as in dying, but literally headed south. You mean in the United States? Yes. Or, or like the whole hemisphere? <laughs> Four decades ago, seven out of ten Catholics lived in the Northeast or the Midwest. Mm-hmm. 70% Northeast, Midwest. Uh, today, let's see, I have to do the math here, uh, 55% live in the American South or the American West. But is that just a reflection of population shifts? Yeah, I think that's It isn't like, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So what? It's big changes, big changes. Okay. And and we got to figure you, out what to do about did it. Did you hear what Steve Bannon said about? Oh, he said all sorts of crazy things. I know, but he said that the reason why the Catholic oh, yeah. Church is against the the DACA repeal yeah, is because they need immigrants he, to fill up the pews. He's just, they need illegal immigrants. Ah, oh, right. They need illegal immigrants to fill up the pews. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. White Christians are a minority in the Democratic Party. Did you know that? White Christians are a minority in the Democratic yes. Party. Yes, okay, I'm yeah, not surprised by that either. Fewer than one in three Democrats are white Christians, down from almost half 10 years ago. So that's just 10 years. That's pretty, from half that's significant. Down to 30%. Yeah. Um, and guess what's happened in the Republican Party? Uh-huh. It's increasingly you think maybe the opposite has happened. I think so. Yeah, while well, white evangelical Protestants are losing adherence, they remain the dominant religious force. Do, the dominant religious force among Republicans. More than one third of Republicans are white evangelicals, which has been stable for the last ten years. So where did the other ones go? There are fewer Democrats that are white evangelicals, or, and more, and the same amount of Republicans. Or they could still be with the Democrats. They just no longer consider themselves evangelicals. Still be with the Democrats. Oh, yeah. Maybe they bailed on the label. Or they could have bailed on being white, but that's a little harder to do. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Almost half of the LGBT population in America is religiously unaffiliated. Mm -hmm. About twice as many as the general population. Mm -hmm. Does that surprise you? No. Given all the statements we keep making. (laughs) (laughs) I can't understand why there aren't more. You're not welcome here. Go away. Hey, well, they went a, away. Why'd they go away? Thing, not only does the statement say they're not welcome here, but anyone who would welcome them if is not welcome here. If you're friends with them, you're not welcome here. Yeah. Why do they? Why do you make them sound like they're Swiss? <laughs> <laughs> why? Why not? The, why the should Swiss they are sound neutral? Like they were Swiss. I'm going against stereotypes. Though atheists and agnostics account for about one fourth of all the religiously unaffiliated, 16 percent of the unaffiliated identify as a religious person. That, what? That's, that makes that's no that's sense. Meaningless. Uh, <laughs> only a quarter of the religiously unaffiliated are atheists and agnostics. Okay. 16 percent describe themselves as religious. But, uh, but the not, unaffiliated, just not aligned to a world so, religion. Wait a minute. I'm not. A, I'm having trouble imagining this. St- of of the religiously unaffiliated, a quarter yes. are atheists. Yes. Sixteen percent are are not religious, yes. and the rest are confused. Yes. Yeah, so no. Sixteen percent are, are religious. They're religious, but they're not affiliated. Yes. Yes. So a quarter. So what is everyone else? Uh, they don't describe themselves as religious, but they don't describe themselves as atheist or agnostic. They're spiritual. I'm a spiritual person. Whatever. I bet it's all the spiritual people. What are, if you're new age, do you describe yourself as religious? If you're into, you know... I think you describe yourself as a sucker. <laughs> we just lost that part of our Yeah, audience. there goes that group. All right. Um, you need to uh, get going. I do have to get yeah, going. And we do have a guest coming in. Uh, thanks, Sky, for stopping by the podcast I'm glad I could week. be here. Let's do it again next week. Are you week. here next week? Briefly. Briefly. I also have to fly out on Monday afternoon. All right. We will see you next week, and we will be right back. Bye, everyone. With our guest. I am here with Carl Medeiros. He is our guest today. He is, uh, I actually don't have a, I don't have a bio on you, Carl. What's your bio? Where where were you born? <laughs> Is that how most it's bios easier. most bios start? Yeah. Rather than making up a bio, it's easier just uh to have the bio from the person, I guess, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> Carl, I'm gonna make one up. Carl is an author, a writer, a speaker, a thinker. Are you a teacher? Do you do you teach anywhere? No. No, no, but you're doing good so far. That's that's a great start. Would and you, a person, a human being, a guy. Are you a missionary? 
I have been a missionary. I'm also a businessman. We do investments, commercial real estate investments. So I have a company oh. in Dubai. I'm married. I'm <gasps> a dad of three kids. Um, okay. And you live yeah. in Texas and Dubai. No, we live between Colorado and Dubai. Oh, sorry. We're you're in, in Texas, Texas right now because you're speaking. I'm in Texas right now. So, yeah, isn't the world fun and confusing? Texas, Dubai, Colorado. Yeah. Missionary, businessman, author. Yeah. Pretend, pretending to be most of those things most of the time. So, Carl has a book uh, called Muslims, Christians, and Jesus. It's been out for a while, but they're coming out with a new edition in a month because he learned some new stuff. Is that why? New That's, stuff? Uh, yes. I mean, that should be the reason why. And I think that is actually the reason, yes. So we went back and he made it way better. So if you already have the book, you need to buy a new copy. And if you don't have the book, <laughs> you need to buy a copy. Because if you have the book, pretty much everything in it is wrong. He figured out <laughs> He figured out that it was mostly wrong. So he did a new edition. So go back and buy the book again. Um, a little bit of your yeah, I, story. You, what, what did you want to be? You moved your family to Beirut in 1992. Is that right? We did. What, mostly because we're crazy. Yeah, what was that all about? I, mean, what, I can say it was God. That's the right. Okay, that's good. So what's the story I mean, up until then? What did you want to be when you were growing up? And then how did you end up moving your family to Beirut? You know, I either wanted to be a survivalist in the mountains of Alaska, hunting and fishing for a living, or a missionary to Muslims. Like, those honestly, were, those, were two, those were the two choices. Those were the two choices. Where did the interest in the Islamic world come from? You know, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska. We didn't have any people of any other ethnicity or religion, but somehow, I guess implanted directly by God, I thought Muslims were interesting and Arabs were cool. I was always, I always thought Yasser Arafat was a misunderstood, nice human being. <laughs> and I don't know where that came from. How did that go over that in Nebraska? Really, yeah, really well. Yeah, really well. <laughs> My dad was a pastor of a, you know, conservative evangelical church is how I've grown up all my life. And uh, no, that didn't go over well at all. So I was a, I was a strange little kid that people would pat on the head and say, oh, that's nice, Carl. It's nice <laughs> that you love Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims, but, you know, they're all terrorists. And I always just had this thought that, yeah, but God loves terrorists. I mean, so shouldn't we love what God loves? And and I don't know. I mean, that came from, I can only have come from the Holy Spirit, I guess, yeah. because, or Others would say it came from another spirit. You know, it depends on who you ask. Okay. Okay. So how'd you end up in Beirut? So, I mean, Chris and I, my wife's name is Chris. We got married in 1986 and literally said, where's the scariest place on the planet right now? And in the eighties, you know, the war yeah. in Lebanon was, that was the scariest place. Americans were being kidnapped. Terry Anderson, Terry Waite, they were all still kidnapped by the Hezbollah. And we said, let's move there. And we did. That's exactly how it happened. Why? 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 Yeah. How did you sell that to your parents? <laughs> That's the question. You ask good questions. My parents were into it because they were crazy church planning pastors and they thought doing great things for God, you know, probably earned you some more points. And I needed points because I was a bad kid. So they're, they were happy for it. Um, my so it was, this was really mom. about extra credit. This was it's absolutely ter- about extra credit. I mean, I grew up in a holiness tradition that you needed, always needed credit. I lost my salvation like every other day. You know, <laughs> my dad would give an altar call on Sunday night and then look at me. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I got saved a lot growing up. Um, and my wife's parents weren't, and her whole family weren't quite as into it as I was, but you know, they're, they're Greek. She grew up Greek. So they're immigrants. Yeah. And so they love the international part. They weren't sure about Beirut. Yeah. But it was okay. It was okay. And I raised our grandkids, their grandkids there. Our two daughters were 18 months or four months old. When we moved to Beirut, we sold everything we had in Colorado, moved there. And our third kid, uh, John, our son was born in Damascus, Damascus, Syria. And they all grew up all their lives there. Our oldest lives back in Beirut now and runs a business incubator in downtown Beirut. Wow. Uh, she's doing great. And then we, mom and I live in Dubai, so we visit each other often from Beirut to Dubai, both going both directions. So, okay. yeah, how, it's quite an adventure. How long have you been in Dubai? We've been there three years now. We were in Beirut 12 years, and then kind of in and out of the 
all different Arab countries for another 12 years, and then have moved back to Dubai the last three years. And we go back actually in two weeks and, to Dubai. And what is, what is the point of all this? Why are you hopping all over the place and living in dangerous places? What is the point of this? Uh, partly, if I'm just being really honest, is because we like it. We actually like the adventure of feeling out of our comfort zone. I mean, both my wife and I are just wired that way. Like I meet with the leaders, the Hezbollah and the Hamas and the Bin Laden family all the time. Uh, we meet with them, talk, talk peacemaking, talk Arab American relationships, talk politics, talk Jesus, talk gospel stuff, talk Bible, Quran, Islam, Christianity. And it's fun. I mean, it's really crazy fun. Yeah. It doesn't make you sweat. Every time sometimes. you, you sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, but you know what's scarier? Try try talking to a bunch of Presbyterians in Midland, Texas, where I am right now. That's scary. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that's scary. Okay, so when when did you write the first uh, draft of this book? The one that we now have discovered is completely wrong. Yeah, exactly. The the ridiculous. So you know, it's funny. Somebody pointed out a couple of years ago in this book, Muslims, Christians, and Jesus, that they didn't agree with something in there. And I said, well, yeah. I mean, I don't agree with. I mean, I wrote that eight years ago. I mean, of course, I don't agree with some of that <laughs> stuff. I mean, do you think we all stay the same? So yeah, uh, two thousand eight, I think, is when it was okay. public. Uh, okay. And just a lot has changed since then. You know, I so I talk about ISIS. Uh, yeah. You know, what about terrorism with Muslim immigration? I try to address current issues with Islam and how we relate to Muslims as Christians uh, in the new edition. So what what did you see going on in the world that made you think we needed a book called Muslims, Christians, and Jesus? Yeah, well, I saw that there was a bit of an issue between Muslims and Christians in general. Uh, Christians are convinced that Muslims hate us. And by the way, Muslims are convinced that Christians hate them. Oh, come on. No way. Yeah, way. It goes, no, are you sure. telling me that it goes both ways? It's a funny thing, but prejudice, bias, misunderstanding actually works almost exactly the same both ways. <laughs> so Man. they think America is trying to take over their countries. They think that Christians hate them. They think that they're afraid of Christian crusaders like the old crusades on a new crusade, taking over their countries, making them Christians and making them like America and putting Starbucks and McDonald's everywhere, which is a Christian thing to do. Yeah. That's what they think. Right. Christians so, come bearing coffee. Christians come in bearing coffee, I mean, uh, Starbucks specifically. Yeah. So, and of course they are happy to drink our Starbucks and eat our <clears> McDonald's <throat> hamburgers and send their kids to our schools, but they still feel colonized. And it's funny. Most colonizees don't like to be colonized. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm a, I'm a white male, so I have no experience with that whatsoever. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, it's not our issue, but no. you know, those other people have these issues. I guess. So, yeah, I guess we've heard that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I read the book to help, I would say my tribe, my tribe is a fairly conservative evangelical Bible believing Jesus following, we would say yeah. tribe. Well, and we don't, understand Muslims or Islam. We don't appreciate them and we're actually against them. And we think that they're the enemy and sometimes they turn out to be the enemy. Yeah. And so I wrote a book about that and to try to help Christians understand what Muslims are doing and thinking and right. how it can relate to them positively and productively. Okay. And one of the things you talk about in the book is uh, areas of commonality between Christians and Muslims as a mm. way to build relationship. What do we have in common? Because I just don't see it. So can oh, you, can you give, me, give me a few things that you see areas where you can build friendships because we have commonality with our Muslim neighbors? Well, well I mean, first of all, Muslim, it's interesting. Muslims are I would say it's like 1950s Christian Kansas. You know, they're very conservative on family values. They're mm -hmm. conservative politically. They're conservative fiscally. They they would agree down the road with a conservative fiscal social platform in American politics 100%. So that's okay. one thing. So they're, they're my people. grandparents. They are your grandparents. That's exactly right. They really are. They're like they're like our grandparents. I mean, they're very conservative. You uh -huh. know, and, and, my, my and grandparents some, would not go to movies. They would not right. play cards. They would not swim on a Sunday because yes. that that was sin. They had a whole huge list of yes. things that proper Christians do not do. 
Yes. I mean, Muslims don't drink. They don't smoke. They don't mm-hmm. sleep around. I mean, theoretically, not that they don't do that, but that's they're not supposed to be doing that. So yeah. they are they are our grandparents from the Midwest. I mean, that, that, so that's a big thing. And then theologically, we have this person, Jesus. You may have heard of him, but yeah. he's in common. And in the Quran, Jesus is called the Word of God. He's called the Messiah. He's called sinless. He worked miracles. He raised the dead. He's still alive today. He's coming back at the end to be the judge. That's Jesus in the Quran. So it's missing God in the flesh. It's missing the crucifixion and resurrection. So it's missing some key theological distinctions. But uh, a lot is in common between us and Jesus. Okay, here's it. Here I got a I got Muslims a and Christians. I got a loaded Jesus. question. I got a loaded question for you. Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? <laughs> and I'm, I'm ask, about two miles from Wheaton College as I'm saying this, where it became an issue yeah, in the last year. I've heard that. I've heard something about that. I've yeah. heard something about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do Jews and Christians worship the same God? Let me ask you a question. Yes, because we worship the God of the Old Testament. Okay, good. So if you ask any... Jude today, do you believe, uh, and then we name 10 things about God, including Jesus being God and the Trinity, no Jew would agree with that. So actually, so that's Jews, because they're wrong about all, those, those parts. Yeah, they're wrong about those points. Exactly. So it's interesting. Muslims probably believe, by the way, this is going to get, this is going to get you in trouble. I, is this, do you like that? Is that okay? Oh, sure. Go for it. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. What could possibly go to, wrong? Well, you don't have to agree with it. You can just after after I after you cut me off, you just say that Carl I, Madaris, yeah, do I not will, listen to him. I will disavow you as soon as we <laughs> cut the line. Okay, go. <laughs> so so uh, it's not that simple to say to. But, so I think where Dr. Hawkins made a mistake is she just simply said uh, yes, they worship the same God. I, I think you can't say that. So the question really is: uh, is the way Muslims perceive God? the way a biblical Christian would perceive God. Because by the way, there's only one God. There's only one of them. There isn't a Muslim God. There isn't a Christian God. There's only one God. And so the question is, is when I grew up, it was the God that was in my head, the God I perceived, was it the real God? The God I grew up with was angry. He was a white man with a long beard and he wanted to hit me over the head all the time. Mm -hmm. So was that the real God? Because you went to movies. Yes and no. In Kansas. It was the real God, but I thought of him wrongly. So I would say Muslims don't believe in God perfectly correctly. Yeah. But I would say you and I don't believe in God perfectly correctly or we'd be God. So okay. we're all in a process to learn who God is and so are they. But the word Allah is simply the word for God in Arabic. So to yeah. say is Allah the real God, that doesn't make sense. All Christians, all Arab Christians worship Allah because that's his name in Arabic. Yeah. So yeah. It's, so, you know, so is it would you a- would you say that Christians, Jews and Muslims are pursuing knowledge of the same God? Yes. Of God, basically. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and you think, so where do we get in trouble, you know, in, in our own little internal battles when we gloss over the distinctions of how we portray or, or view God? Yes. I mean, I think uh, we're the three monotheistic religions, right, who believe in one God. So it's not like asking if a Hindu believes in the same God or or a Buddhist yeah. uh, who don't believe in God the way we think of that or an animist. You know, I mean, that the, the three monotheistic religions are all trying to believe in and think about and understand the one true God. And we all do it differently. And of course, we believe we're right. And I think as much as we are right, we're right. And to be humble, most Christians, I mean, I would say no 1%. I mean, how much of God do I know? Do I know 1% of all there is to know about God? Probably not. Probably not that, but probably not 1%. Yeah. You know, so. Okay. Muslims are on a journey. What Muslims do you, are on a journey. What like do you think are. growing up with conservative Christians, um, like, like we, we have in our, in our grandparents, what, what do you th- see Christians misunderstanding the most about their Muslim neighbors that makes it hard to get to know them? I just think the big one is Christians are tempted to believe that all Muslims are terrorists or that somehow Islam or the Quran teaches them to be terrorists or to kill Christians. That is a, I mean, that's a huge mistake. That's not true, even 1%. The Quran doesn't tell Muslims to kill all Christians. It doesn't say that anywhere. 
Uh, can can a bad guy Muslim use the Quran to support his terrorism? Yes. Mm-hmm. But can a bad guy Christian use the Old Testament to support his violence? Yes. Yeah. Is either one contextually correct? No. Mm-hmm. You, you, neither one should do that. So that's the biggest issue is just that we think Muslims are this weird group that want to kill people. Yeah. And unfortunately, the news, you could think that, but it's not true. Is, is interpretation of the Quran, uh, how centralized is it? You know, like at one point there was just the Pope who would say, no, 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 this is how you read the Bible. And then we kind of smash that to bits in the Christian world. And now, you know, there's a, as many voices interpreting the Bible as there are people um, in the Western world. Mm-hmm. Is it similar in in uh, the the Middle East and in the Muslim world for interpreting the Quran? Are there any central authorities that, because people say the Quran is a book of peace and other people say, you know, the Quran is telling me that I need to, you know, wipe out the, the, the infidel. Is there an, a higher authority that says you're right and you're wrong? You know, there really isn't. There isn't, say, Pope or a Billy Graham. You know, I don't know who the Protestant version of that is, but there isn't one of those in Islam. They uh, they are quite segmented, and they can listen to different teachers that will tell them different things. There are 1.7 billion Muslims, give or take, yeah. and they have 1.7 billion versions of Islam. So I would say they're at least as fragmented as the Christian world is, which is good news or bad news, depends how you think of yeah, it. Yeah, so it's this, it's the same problem where where someone, I mean, if someone is a skeptic of Christianity, it's pretty easy for them to come up with a pastor somewhere who says something completely outlandish and then paint exactly. Christianity with that brush. Do, do we do the same yeah. thing with Muslims? Yes, exactly. It's exactly the same. Okay. So yeah, they, they do have they have authorities that are teachers of the Quran. Like we have pastors. They have theologians who they respect more or less. Uh, a lot of those are in Saudi Arabia and Egypt. I would say those are the two countries that most of those come from. But yeah, it's very diverse. Okay. So when you hear someone say, you know, if you commit violence in in the name of Islam, you've hijacked the religion. Is that is that an inaccurate statement? Is that an accurate statement? Is it simply choosing a fringe interpretation? Is that hijacking? How do you look at that? I mean, you know, let's think of Christians Mm -hmm. uh, quoting the Bible for capital punishment or for bombing Iraq or North Korea. Let's think of Christians in support of whatever the president's agenda is and and how we cherry pick Bible verses for whichever side we want to, you know, support. It's yeah. very, very similar. So I would say generally speaking, if we say terrorism and Islam go together or the Quran supports terrorism or that Islam is a violent religion, that that's us feeding into the terrorist agenda. I think we shouldn't say that about them on their behalf. I mean, it doesn't help when others say to Christians that you guys are all crazy or you guys are, Yeah, it, it never helps for one side to try to define the other side by its negative. Right, right. And that doesn't help anything in there. So let, let's, let's support the moderate Muslims, which is the fat, vast majority who say Islam is a peaceful religion. Why, why would we fight with them and say, no, you're not? Right. You know, let's say, <laughs> yeah, I mean, think about that. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Let's say, great. That's that's awesome that you're a peaceful religion. Let's let's make peace together. That that sounds, oh, Jesus is a prince of peace. Let's follow Jesus and make peace. Yeah. Why would we say to them, you're not the right interpretation of Islam? The the crazy ones are the right. Right, right. We, we, we want that those guys. Sense, we want actually. those guys to win the theological battle. Okay, uh, it's last last topic, and this I think exactly. is is really the purpose uh, of your book because you get into you know very practical accounts of of befriending Muslims and finding common ground. You know what's what's the best way? <laughs> Give us an example of how not to befriend the, a Muslim on your street, <laughs> and then a good way of how how to befriend Muslims on your street. Well, I think this is very profound stuff, so you should probably write this down, but uh, how not to befriend them is to not talk to them. And okay. how to befriend them is to say hi. <laughs> so this is a 
you know, very. Hey, deep. I think I could have come up with that on my own. I'm, I'm looking for <laughs> something little. So talk to them. Okay. So say hi. Yeah. And then say, how are you doing? Whoa. And then, there we go. That's, yeah. See? See? That's the thing that you weren't doing before. I wasn't. I was stopping with the high. I was stopping with the high. And you have to say, how you doing? You kind of have to say it, how you doing? Kind of like with uh, like a New Jersey act. How you doing? They like that? Because, you know, I don't know why. Yeah. No, you just talk to them. I mean, you know, I mean, the funny thing is, is that we sometimes are tempted. We're tempted to think Muslims are like aliens. Yeah. You know, how do you talk to a Martian? Yeah. Well, I don't know how you talk to a Martian, but how you talk to a Muslim is like you talk to your neighbor, Bob or John or Billy or Karen. You just say, hi, how you doing? What's going on? Hey, you know, so uh, hi, where wait. are you from originally? If they look at their- Let me see if I've got this straight. Hi, how you doing? Yeah. Is your religion a religion of war? <laughs> yes. <Is that the- laughs> you know, that's one way. That's one way to do it. And then... <laughs> How do you, is, is it, Actually, at what point can you, do you feel like you can enter into, you know, substantive conversations or is that really like way down the road? No, it's so easy. You know, we in America say you don't talk about religion and politics and polite company. Right. But that's not true. They start out with religion. They're likely to say, so are you a Christian? Like right up front. Or they're going to say, did you vote for Trump? Like right up front. I mean, there's no, okay. and they'll ask you how much your shirt costs. And, <laughs> you know, there's nothing private. It's actually really, it's actually, they're the easiest people to talk with, but you just have to start the conversation and you can ask them anything. You can ask them, is Islam a religion of war? As long as you laugh and make a joke right after you say it, then it's probably actually okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I can ask them how much their clothing costs? Yes, you can. Just Absolutely. And where did you buy it? And, you can't. I mean, seriously, it's the funniest thing. They Muslims are maybe the easiest people to hang out with and talk to. They love to laugh. They love jokes. They love good food. I used to be skinny before I moved to the Muslim world. You know. <laughs> so, do you think? Do you um, do you feel hopeful at all about the state yeah. of things right now? Where where can solutions come from? Because it just seems to be a big ugly mess. Yeah, I do feel hopeful. I think, I mean, the role of the church, the role of people who say that, that we follow Jesus is, of course, one of hope, kind of by definition. And I feel as hopeful as the church has hope. And I think if we believe in a God that brings hope and a Jesus, as we follow him, is a, the master hope giver, then as long as we are following Jesus, we'll follow him right into fun, messy relationships like with your Muslim neighbor named Ahmed down the road, whose wife is covered from head to toe and you're intimidated by them because you wonder what they're up to. But if you get over yourself and say, hi, remember that part, the hi part. Hi, how are you? How are you? How you doing? And how you doing from originally? And then are you trying to, are you trying to kill me? You know, (laughs) that that's always helpful. Uh, So, I'm, I mean, seriously, I'm I just not think sure that part is helpful. That might not be. That might not be helpful. But, but you know, I mean, it's actually a funny thing. All the Muslims I know here in America are the best people ever. They're, they want exactly. They want the little son Muhammad to get more playing time on the soccer team. And yeah. They're upset at the coach because he's not playing him. But then the mom says, if you talk to the coach, then the coach will be mad at your son and he'll play. He'll have less playing time. So don't talk to the coach. That's what they want. I mean, that's exactly, they want their son to have more playing time on the soccer team and they want to have a better car and a stable job and a good college for their kids. But then, that's it. But then they want to take over and implement Sharia law. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. We see them doing that, right? I mean, everywhere. Sharia law is everywhere now. <laughs> okay. Well, so, some of them must think that, right? Or the rumor wouldn't have started, right? Uh, I don't, I mean, not that I know of. I go to Dearborn, you know, near Detroit all the time where Muslims are concentrated. And yeah, uh, right. And I know them really well. And, I don't, and they're not doing that. Really? So, you don't bump into any yeah. that want to take over? Uh, okay. Not in America. I've bumped into a handful in 33 years in the Middle East that if they were given the chance, okay, would probably take over everything. Mm-hmm. And. You know, so there are some Muslims I've, somewhere who I've want bumped to into a few, stuff. I've bumped into a few pastors who also have that. 
Yeah, that want to take over. Want exactly. to take over everything. All right. Well, that's cool. Okay. Uh, anything else that, that we didn't cover? Um, the book is called um, Muslims, Christians, and Jesus. The the guest is Carl Medeiros. It's from Baker Books. The new edition is coming out in a in a month, which is the the edition that gets it right. Whew. Sorry about that other edition, everyone. Um, yes. Is yes. there is there anything Sorry we missed that embarrassing. is there anything we missed that's that we should know what sh- what else should we know about the Muslims living next door that we don't know? Yeah, no, thanks, Phil. I mean, honestly, I mean, I've been we're being a little bit funny, but honestly, I think it's as simple as us getting over our own embarrassment, our own insecurity, our own fear, and we know what drives out fear: it's love. And the beginning letters of love are H-I. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Hi. My name's Carl. Hi. I'm embarrassed to say I've never talked to you before. So sorry. Uh, You know, who are you? I mean, you you have to start with hi. And uh, that's actually not, that's not being facetious or silly. You can't get to the deeper questions unless you start with saying hello. Mm -hmm. So, I actually think it's as simple as that. And that's the beginning of love, which is the thing that will drive out fear in you. Muslims yeah. don't have the, actually some Muslims are afraid of us too, but mostly it's us. We're the host. Why are we afraid of them? They're in our country. Why are we afraid of them? Yeah. So get over yourselves and let's get on with being a little bit like Jesus and just saying hi to them. Just say hi. Just say hi. Have you ever heard the podcast before? I mean, I'd like to say I'm a regular listener, but I know. That's okay. If you were a regular listener, you would know that this is a point in the show where I try to summarize everything we said with the ukulele song, which usually goes poorly. So, and I especially appreciate trying to come up with songs on the spot dealing with somewhat touchy subjects, like, say, Christian-Muslim yep. relations. So, for fear of launching an international incident, I'm going to go ahead and try anyway. Hmm. Hey, Carl, your last name's Medeiros. You told us about the Muslims that might be living near us, and you say that maybe even they can kind of fear us, just like we're afraid of them, them. Oh, but we can say hi, invite them over, and uh, we can talk about uh, the yards that are full of clover and that they want their kids to play soccer even more than we do as well. Uh, can we bring up hell? Probably not. I think that's all we can tell. So you can talk with them. You can walk with them. You can ask how much their clothes cost to them. <laughs> and read Carl's book called Muslims, Christians, and Jesus Cause that's a good way to know Just how that you can show The love of God everywhere you go To your Muslim neighbors Alright, Carl <laughs> Thank you, yeah, I know I know uh, what, what can awesome. I say? It's a spiritual gift um, Thanks for being on the show Thanks for doing what you do have fun uh, going back over to Dubai and carrying the love of Jesus wherever you go. Thanks, man. That was awesome. You're yeah, welcome. Thanks, and you guys, uh, be back next week. Sky will be back next week. Will Christian be back next week? Is Christian back next week? There's a distinct possibility. There's a distinct possibility that Christian will be back next week, and we'll have a guest also next week. Thanks so much for listening. We will see you next time. Bye. The Phil Fisher Podcast is produced by Phil Fisher Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com. <laughs>